I'm Hannah Hyams, the art teacher at West Hill High. And this year I have under 150 students. The majority of them are in grade eight, and that includes three sculpture classes, two art 31, and two senior classes art 51. The approach in art I am trying to inculcate is one of problem solving and cognitive, which will include perception, which will include um, art history, which will include working with every type of media we can afford. At this point, we started with Pat Gay Maché, which everyone always has freely. That is a combination of newspapers, paste, imagination, and a great deal of time. Um, we started making three-dimensional objects of our papier mache Animals, mainly, you must remember, this is a grade eight level. These students have come from elementary school and have really had no particular art training, a little here and a little there. And so the formation of a three-dimensional object can be quite formidable. Um, we started by trying to sketch what they had in mind. This, I may say, was a flop. To be able to feel a three-dimensional object and to be able to draw it are two different things. I then discovered that to just tackle it with wire, with string, with cardboard, with bristol board, as an armature, as one does in sculpture, and then cover it with papier mache was our best bet. At the same time, we're trying to follow the art history program. And that meant doing caveman drawings, doing North American Indian masks, doing Eskimo masks, and working generally with the early stages of art in Quebec and in Canada. Uh, the masks have been a success. The students have completed them. Um, they have put their own imagination into it. I won't say that they are duplicates of copies that are in the National Gallery, although we started off with bona fide drawings of Northwest Coast Indian masks and Eskimo masks. Uh, they then completed the work of the papier mache, sanded it down as one would any sculptural piece, painted it with watercolor gouache, uh, shellacked it for a permanent finish, and added their own touches, which included wire, rope, material, beads, wood shavings, straw, cotton, in other words, anything anyone could contribute to make this object a thorough aesthetic piece. The very simple method of producing these masks was to make a cardboard rim, which we then stuck with a paper sack full of newspaper to act as a cushion over which the strips of newspaper were then laid. And then, of course, the cushion, when it's finished, is removed so that you have a very lightweight mat. Uh, some of the finished product, after painting and not yet shellacked, I have a rather gay look. And as I mentioned, they are assented as to the type. They each have a name. Some are the horse man and various Indian and Eskimo names, of which I don't have labeled at this point. Uh, but as one can see from the antlers, this would obviously be a totem animal mask used in various ceremonials. Um, we went from the mask, although some children went from the animal to the mask and found a little more difficulty in doing a three-dimensional object 
because an armature had to be built. And one of the stipulations was that if it's supposed to stand, then it must do that. Some were rather ambitious and actually made very large pieces, some of which are in the showcases, which you will photograph later. Many put humor into their three-dimensional objects and enjoyed very much what they were doing. It becomes more and more obvious. Uh, this particular student has never forgiven me because I always refer to this as he. Uh, obviously, she's very strong about that. There are some that went away from our early Canadian history and went ahead to the next chapter, which is Egyptian. And there are always a few, thank goodness, who push us ahead. And these are the ones that keep us going. Others didn't follow any particular pattern. They let their own diabolical feelings come out. And that, too, is a good thing sometimes. From this, we went to the caveman drawing, which are still in progress, but were interrupted because of the Christmas decorations. We tried to follow the same idea as the caveman by using the same four basic colors, which was the terracotta, the yellow ochre, the black, and the white clay. We used simple brown craft paper, which we then oiled, to give it an old parchment-like look. Some rumpled there, some left them plain. And we are going to continue with these after the stained glass windows, which work in about the same manner. We used the same brown craft paper. Each student did his own original design. He then outlined his design with black ink or paint in the place that the lead would be to hold the colored glass panes. He then colored the in-between section. Once again, we oiled the back of the brown paper to give it a translucent effect this time, rather than an old look, because we have put these up on the front door of the building where the light goes through them and gives us a very good translucent effect. All this material that we have used to date is very inexpensive and can be had in almost any school or any area. And every student can contribute his bit, whether it be a geometric pattern, if that is his particular bag, or a figurative one. In any case, their personality shows through. This is the stage before the coloring. It shows the letting or the black paint. And the design is carefully worked out. Some are more traditional. But besides being more traditional, I may add that many of the more traditional are students who have more adaptability in drawing, and they use it. We are doing smaller pieces for the side windows. This is the beginning, the letting, and then the coloring. Actually, we haven't started painting as such in grade eight. We are also using parts of old Javex bottles to make Christmas trees and bells and angels and faces and many other decorations which are in the showcases. Some of the structures of the masks where wire were used, this was an authentic mask. 
he is having a little trouble, but originally it was a very interesting, authentic Northwest Coast man. Uh, I've talked mainly about the juniors because they are the bulk of my program. Many of the juniors have also become involved in printing. These are liner cuts where we worked up textile designs, wallpaper designs, and just designs. These are repetition of lino cut prints. And for most of them, it was the first time they became involved in printing. And they're very enthusiastic about it. And I now have another idea for doing a collagraph type of print that will give them more scope. Um, I haven't talked too much about the senior art. Most of the senior art is in the corridor. The seniors have approached art in a very intricate manner. Part of the reason for this was a visit to the PSBGM library, where some of last year's matriculation art was displayed. It inspired the students tremendously, and when they came back, they indulged in very controversial and difficult type of drawing. Uh, many of the symbols here really would make one think of Bosch in some of his drawings. Um, various others went into very simple, symbolic, modern approach to it. A good deal of perception went into feeling and movement into this particular black and white. Painting, always more difficult. And I do really not expect what I call painting, and that is not color drawing, but painting, until several, several months hence. We start both junior and senior with collage, uh, which is a breakdown of the French collet to paste to blue, to make a form out of using any found material that is arranged to a complete form. Now this particular student again indulged in a very complicated design. The seniors are also drawing the usual still life, which I don't particularly agree with, but they ask to do still life. I prefer the breakdown of still life into a design. Figure drawing, we use our own students as models. And we usually have a 15 minute sitting period and change models. This is always a very casual study and they enjoy it extremely well. Uh, Bassarelli type complicated geometric design is also favored by many of the students. Some of them indeed are very Mondrian like, more complicated perhaps because they do not agree with the simplicity of form that comes with maturity. Some, again, show their humor, put out in a very sensitive fashion, both with color and form and composition. Again, we had collage of a solid nature using two types of geometric figures. The seniors are going ahead uh, being much more complicated in a sense, and especially after the Paylab visit, we're very inspired. They're inspired to do perfect theater masks. Um, I hope that by February, we will have a senior program that we will be very proud of. which is conducive to creativity and stimulation for the students. They have mobile and lots of work. All their work goes up, hopefully, or, or you know, something representative from each student. There are kids in here from 
other classes there. Not skipping, but they like to come and work here. Plus a junior class, a grade eight, nine class. And they're, most of them are doing painting at the moment. I uh, usually with the seniors, um, I started with something very spontaneous, like monoprint. I had them ink the glass plate and just make various scratches and marks on the plate, just freeform, spontaneous, and then print. Gradually, I worked into something more controlled. Here you'll see one mark with variations on the mark, which creates an overall unity within the monoprint. And I worked on balance and lights and darks, movement, rhythm, unity. And then this is worked into something more representational. You can see here figures in the bottom bit. They worked on portraits of themselves or of each other. Some are quite representational. They worked on asymmetry rather than symmetry. There's an imbalance here in lights and darks, but at the same time, an overall um, aesthetic balance. Some of them took their monoprints and worked further on them in color. You can see they took color ink and carried it even further. Some may think this is an artificial approach to the monoprint because it should be a completely spontaneous thing. But others tried to make it, tried not to make it artificial you know, by working on the monoprint. Um, from here, the great elaborate is the collage. If you look over there on that far wall, they studied some of the American artists um, like Motherwell, Motherwell and Franz Klein, the artists who worked primarily in black and white. We looked at black and white in balance, in positive and negative, in movement, in transparencies, in symmetry and asymmetry, and in overall unity within the composition. And I think some of them show quite a good understanding of the elements in black and white. Um, several people are working on individual projects. One boy, senior boy here, is working on a door mural. He'd like to have a look at this. He skipped his collage because he's been concentrating on this for about, I guess, a month now. Two months now. Could you get a closer look at it, if possible? He's Bruce, one of my very good art, senior art student, and maybe he'll tell you a little bit about what he's doing here. Um, well, it's acrylic paint, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a lot different from any other kind of paint, because it's really thick, and you have to put it on around five coats. Like this part here, I put around six coats on just to get it like that. Probably going to have to put more. Um, How do you like the medium as compared to poster paint? Oh, it's a lot better. It gives you more to work with, even though it's like painting with toothpaste. It's yeah, a lot it's, not, it's very textural. It is. Yeah. You can get all, all different sorts of, of sort of feelings. In it. It's like you get round, you get thick, you get plastered. And it's quick drying also, which is you know really important to the kids so that they can work coat upon coat without having to wait for, for it to dry. Um, Jim, what are you trying to say here? Um, I'm not really trying to say anything. It, it's just people get what they get out of it. Um, it, it just, it's just something that I put down. And, you know, people come up, they, they find what they find in it. Yeah, and Jim has had millions of people, well, not literally, but um, practically everyone in the hall stops and talks to Jim about his mural, and the kids in the school seem you know, quite impressed with it. And I think, in a way, it's introducing a lot of people who rarely come into this room to the art room. It draws them into the room. Besides, it's a lot more fun to stand up and talk to people. <laughs> a lot of people are quite impressed with the mobiles in the room. They break up the space and they give it a lot, I guess, more of a focal point in the room. You know, people are drawing certain mobiles. They've worked on balance within the form, lights and darks, unity. You know, all the, the basic elements have been incorporated into the, the mobile. And um, the senior students are now working on sculpture. Here's one senior student here working on a wood construction. Heather, would you like to say a few words about it? What you're doing? Um, well, basically, I'm trying to make um, the sculpture balance. Mm -hmm. And, well, it's supposed to work, but... Uh, I think it does. It's got a good movement in it anyway. I find that um, I'm having to paint it now, and I find yeah. that it's my first time working with acrylic. So. And it's not quite finished, I've got a lot more to add to it, make it larger. 
I think she, she's going to use bright, flat colors to try and break up the form with color and ach achieve advancing and receding shapes with various colors, depending on, you know, the, the advancing. Some colors tend to advance, others to recede, and to break up this form as such. See the boy working with flat, bright colors as well. Um, Richard's working on a design for the cupboards, the back of the room, form of decoration. Can you cut it now? Now, the seniors aren't the only ones doing sculpture. Juniors are also having an opportunity to work in three dimensions. Um, a lot of them have worked in clay, with clay, on a smaller scale of a bust. And sometimes they are representing themselves, others just representing an emotion within themselves. So, you know, the character may not be them at all, but it does express an emotion. They looked at a number of sculpt sculptures done by Michelangelo and Rhoda, and then applied it to their own in the, you know, the form, the texture, the volume within the sculpture. And Willa here has done quite an interesting little bust. Looks like almost a Russian cot hat, <laughs> And she's glazing at the moment. It's already had a bisque firing. It's going to go back and kill the glaze fine after the glaze. The grade eights and nines are also working on landscape paintings with one color and black and white tints and shades and approaching it very spontaneously with a quick brush stroke. They've already had a lot of experience in painting and done a lot of color exercises and their paintings are beginning to take very good shape now. Can I show this here? She's, she's not finished with course, but you can see the type of work they're doing. They also did landscape paintings just in the fall that were reminiscent of the group of seven. If you just can you shoot over there. One thing in particular they worked on being able to analyze the painting from all angles. Right side up, upside down, on its side. So it's not a representation of the landscape so much but the integration of art elements and the expression of themselves through their art elements and of landscape. And I think these say that very well. Manipulating those until the finished product is there. And on our kind of show, it's very really that that will take up the whole show. It'll take up anywhere from four to 15 minutes. And because it's a magazine kind of show with different items. Um. Are there different classes of producers, like juniors or seniors? Not here there aren't. There are, well, there are and there aren't. There are uh, executive producers, or coordinating producers, as they're now called, who are really the executives in charge of programs. And then there are producers who produce programs. There, there's a, a, a bureaucratic hierarchy. The executive producer is ultimately responsible for a show, uh, such as Hourglass, which is a daily show. But the daily producer, uh, of which there are two on Hourglass, will be responsible for his individual shows. So, yes, but they, they, there are no junior and seniors amongst the producers themselves. How important is a producer to a production? Only as important as everything else in it. Uh, without it, it's, it's a very common metaphor. It's as strong as its weakest link. Any production is. And uh, are you running out of... Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, producer is, is the show is not going to be any good if, if the producer isn't any good. It's not going to be any good if uh, the researcher or story editor or interviewer or cameraman or guest uh, isn't good. Um, no, nothing can cover for something else. Uh, and the item is as good as I say, it's the weakest link involved in its production. Um, what qualifications do you have to have before you become a producer? There are no absolute qualifications. Uh, people, as I mentioned at the beginning, people who become producers from uh, all many other types of uh, work. Um, I guess you have to have a, a liberal arts background, which is to say you should know something about uh, arts and letters. You should have some social science background, uh, sociology, political science, uh, history. and. After that, it depends what kind of work. If you're going to be a drama producer, well, you have to know drama. If you're going to be a sports producer, you have to know sports. 
going to be a variety producer, you have to know music and, and variety. If you're going to be a public affairs producer, you have to know journalism. Uh, there are no specific re requirements. Is there any any special age you have to be? No. No? No. Uh, you mean like 35 or something? Yeah. No. Uh, do you do other jobs around the studio? No, you're not allowed. Uh, <laughs> It, the CBC is an, is an entirely unionized uh, corporation, and a uh, producer only produces. A uh, cameraman only does uses a camera. A uh, sound man only plays around with uh, sound equipment. No, or film or cam film cameraman only shoots film. Nobody does anything else. Um, do you usually get along with the actors or the crew? Well, if you don't, it shows. <laughs> you have to. Really, uh, on a production like ours, which is a daily production, there's very little time for dramatics. That's it. <laughs> Si vous 